Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. A sly wit named Clarence Darrow, who had more than a few enemies, once said, I never wanted to see anyone die, but there are a few obituary notices I have read with pleasure. Had Darrow met my guest today, I believe his pleasure reading obits would have multiplied tenfold. She is Marguerite Fox, who wrote more than 1,400 obits for the New York Times, well-told tales of the lives of kings and commoners, but now the end has come. Ms. Fox just retired from the Times to write books full-time. Her latest is a lively read, Conan Doyle for the Defense, the true story of a sensational British murder, a quest for justice, and the world's most famous detective writer. Marguerite Fox and the man who invented Sherlock Holmes, next. Marguerite Fox, welcome to the program. What a delight to meet you. Thank you. My pleasure. I am going to miss your byline because whenever I saw it in the paper, I knew I was about to read something just remarkably well written and, and a joy. Well, thank you. In that case, Tony, I have wonderful news for you. I have <laughs> retired from the Times indeed, but I have left behind something like 80 advance obits for the undead. The undead. We have to talk about you. Marguerite, in case you missed it, uh, wrote herself a wonderful send-off from the Times, appeared on page two that day, um, and talked about some of the undead and the advance obits, and one of them you, you, you singled out a, a, a prolific um, uh, writer, I guess. I mean, you're not going to name the person, but you wrote the advance how long ago? I wrote it first in 1995, and indeed, I could tell you who it is, but I'd have to kill you, and uh, I'd rather not. <laughs> You've been very nice. Uh, it's for a major American scholar who was not a young man when I first wrote the advance story of his life and death, and blast him, he is so obscenely productive that every time he has a new book or gives a new lecture or <laughs> stirs the public pot in some way, I have to update his advance. Oh, it's unbelievable. And uh, would you imagine you'd be doing that even as a, a an ex-Times writer, if there are more advances, I mean, uh, updates necessary? Well, it remains to be seen. I think I would ju just as soon hand that work off of updating to younger colleagues with more energy than I. All right. And I do have to ask you, you said writing obits is the best beat in journalism. Why? Well, think about what an obit does. There's that boilerplate that every obit in any paper, large or small, has. You say John Doe was born on January 1st, 1910. John Doe died yesterday. There's your built-in narrative arc. It's the most purely narrative part of any daily paper, and writers love to get paid to tell stories. Well, and you also call it the jolliest. Uh, beat on the paper. It's, that's a little hard to well, cope with. Well, I can speak only for the Times Obit Department, but it uh, comprises lively, smart, funny people. Uh, one of my editors is literally a very fine, semi-professional stand-up comic. So for a department okay. that would appear to be centered on death, there is a tremendous amount of laughter and a tremendous amount of joy. Well, well, you brought a you brought a, um, a remarkable sense of style and storytelling to it, and I do. I, I really want to quote uh, from Marguerite Sendoff her own epitaph. This is what she wrote uh, as a suggested epitaph for herself. Quote: She was a decent stylist. She didn't get too many things wrong. She didn't tick too many people off. At times, she wrote obits with tears in her eyes but far more often she wrote them from joy. It was the joy that sprang from the extraordinary privilege of tracing the arc in sweet-smelling newsprint damp with ink of lives well lived. That is beautiful. Well, thank you, and I, I really mean every word. I didn't write it just because it sounds good, although 
if I'm lucky, it does sound good. But the great privilege of writing obits is getting the chance to touch history. I'll give you a quick example. Many years ago, I was writing an obit for a man who was born, oh, around 1910, 1911. He was born in Arizona. And as I started to type, born in Arizona, a little warning bell went off in my head, the bell that every journalist should have. And I said, dummy, look up when Arizona joined the union. And sure enough, I was able to say, sitting in my office in bustling 21st century Times Square, he was born in the Arizona Territory. Territory. How wonderful is that? <laughs> That's telling a story. Yeah. Well, I'm glad there are perhaps 80 more to be read, which only await the death of the people involved. Don't wish any bad to them, but I'll look forward to those deadlines. Meanwhile, this book, it, it, what a what a luminous read. Conan Doyle, the uh, true story of a sensational British murder, a quest for justice, and the world's most famous detective writer, Conan Doyle for the defense. This book has a murder case that features stolen jewels, a secret note smuggled out of prison in false teeth, venal cops, coached witnesses, a little old lady, and Sherlock Holmes' creator. Could have been one of Conan Doyle's stories. Indeed, and it turns out to be all true. The case centers on the murder of a wealthy old woman, Marion Gilchrist, murdered in her elegant flat in Glasgow, Scotland, just before Christmas 1908. The police pull off the street an immigrant German Jewish gambler named Oscar Slater. They know within a few days that he's innocent, but they railroad him anyway because they want him off their streets. And they railroaded him into a conviction and almost into the grave. We'll come back to that point, and it's really central. Um, how long have you been working on this? Or when did you become aware of this story? I actually became aware of this story 30 years ago when I had just left graduate school, come to New York. I was in my 20s, was working at an uninspiring mm. entry-level job in book publishing, and my subway reading on the A train on my morning commute that day was a biography of Conan Doyle published in the 1940s. And toward the end, almost as an aside, the biographer says, Oh, by the way, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle also played real-life detective on a murder case in 1908 and managed, after many years, to get a wrongful conviction overturned. Indeed. It's something that I think many, probably readers of Sherlock Holmes mysteries, maybe don't know, or certainly people, uh, I don't think, I didn't know uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was as much a uh, 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 crusader and investigator as he was a writer and of course a doctor. Conan Doyle is remembered today and of course with good reason as the author of 60 Sherlock Holmes stories and novellas but what is less well remembered apart from his being a doctor is that in his day and he lived until 1930 he was very much a public crusader. He was one of the most famous men not only in Britain but in the world and he used his wealth and renown to champion underdogs. He himself had come from dire poverty, grew up with nothing in mm. Edinburgh, Scotland, and never forgot where he came from. And had the, uh, the, the abductive, to use your term, powers, the, the, the ultra-rational mind, he was Sherlock Holmes in person. In many respects, yes. He, made a great show of denying that he himself was Holmesian. And indeed, he was this big bluff man with a walrus mustache. He looked much more like any film Dr. Watson that we've seen. <laughs> but as yeah. he f did admit, he said, a writer must have some semblance of this character within him in order to create him convincingly. And indeed, Conan Doyle did. Okay, the case, murder case, Miss Gilchrist, 1908, Glasgow, and they immediately police uh, uh, settle on this guy, Oscar Slater. He's the guy. And uh, as you point out, the case, not even a six-year-old would have believed the, the, you know, the case. Why did they 
why was it believed? Why, did, why would that happen at that time in Scotland? Well, the ostensible reason for apprehending Slater was that uh, Miss Gilchrist, who was very wealthy and kept a fortune in jewels in her flat, hidden in curious places, she was brutally bludgeoned to death. Her maid told the police that only a single thing was missing. That was a diamond brooch in the shape of a crescent moon. Mm -hmm. Woe betide Oscar Slater, by pure coincidence, he had pawned a similar brooch. Not the same one, but it was a diamond brooch crescent-shaped, that was all the pretext the police needed to pursue and arrest him. They learned within a week of the murder that Slater's brooch was different. It had been pawned. It wasn't, it wasn't her brooch. It wasn't her brooch. It had been pawned a month earlier. There was no dispute that it was something, a piece he had owned for years. As Conan Doyle said, with that, the very bottom of the case dropped out, but they pursued him anyway. It was Why? One, it was a very high profile case and the cops were under pressure to, as we would say, close the case. And two, Slater was a man, he had lived in Glasgow before, he was a gambler which was disreputable, he was a foreigner in a time of great xenophobia and a Jew in a time of great anti-Semitism. The police were only too happy to roll him into this case, fabricate whatever evidence they needed suppress whatever exculpatory evidence came to light, and there was a lot, and do everything they could to run him out of town, or in this case, they came within 48 hours of running him up to the gallows. It, it, the notoriety of this case can't be understated, although it has been over the years. I mean, it's, it has become known as, as the, uh, the Scottish or the British Dreyfus case. That's right. Uh, the cap, the French captain Alfred, Alfred Dreyfus. Alfred Dreyfus, because like that case, although that case of course involved a false charge of espionage treason. Yeah. and treason, uh, this case, which involved a false charge of murder, the commonality of course is a wellspring of anti-Semitism at the center right. of each now, case. Right, the captain Dreyfus was a Jew, and in this case, uh, Conan Doyle, Arthur Conan Doyle, in a, you could say plays the role of Emile Zola in the, um, in the Dreyfus case. Very much so. Both Jacques and and essentially got the uh, verdict against uh, Dreyfus reversed. That's right. Um, getting back to Conan Doyle and Oscar Slater, uh, Doyle gets involved three years after he's convicted. Well, as you say, he was 48 hours from death. They, they sentenced him to death, but somehow that got commuted within 48 hours to life in prison. The detail that absolutely chills me is Oscar Slater was so close to being executed, he had literally made arrangements for his own burial. That's just chilling. And there was enough public unease about the conviction and about the sentence of death, that a public petition was got up. Remember, there were, was no court of criminal appeals in Scotland at mm -hmm. that time, so a death sentence right. meant you were going to die. The petition went all the way up to King Edward VII. He, two days before Slater was set to die, commuted his sentence to life at hard labor. He was dispatched to Peterhead Prison in the north of Scotland, barren, windswept, Icy. The gulag. The gulag. It was called Scotland's gulag, and he spent the next 18 and a half years breaking up granite blocks in the prison quarry. And Doyle, Conan Doyle, doesn't get involved in the case until three years in. I mean, he's uh, uh, Slater's in prison already three years before, I guess, Doyle becomes aware and starts to work his magic. I mean, he really destroyed the case, but didn't get anywhere. That's right. Uh, Conan Doyle becomes involved publicly, probably at the behest of Slater's lawyers, in about 1912. Slater has been in prison since 1909, and Conan Doyle, using the methods of logical reasoning of his most famous creation and using his skill as a writer and his celebrity as a writer, writes a book that's published in 1912 in which he dismantles this jury-rigged case against Slater plank by plank, 
points out all the holes, the inconsistencies, the outright lies, the suppression of exculpatory evidence, but indeed public sentiment against Slater is still strong enough and this league of less than honest cops and prosecutors and lawyers is still tight enough that nothing gets done. Slater stays where he is, breaking up granite. For 18 and a half years. Um, you know, this is a time, uh, th this kind of justice or injustice was common then, but it was beginning to change. You, you talk about Victorian criminology versus what um, us, uh, what um, uh, Conan Doyle uh, brought to investigation. Tell us a little bit about that and how the how the uh, the times were changing. One of the things that really doomed Slater is the pure accident of when this case occurred. It occurred at a pivotal moment in criminology when what we would call forensics and forensic science are in embryo. Forensic science as we know it involving proper police labs, state-of-the-art mm -hmm. equipment, really did not begin to come into its own until the 1930s and 40s. So the Slater case happened too soon in terms of history for anything forensic to save him. Fingerprinting, which we take for granted as part and parcel of criminal investigation today, had just come in. In fact, it was so new in the first decade of the 20th century that in the entire Sherlock Holmes story canon, there are maybe only half a dozen references to using fig fingerprinting, which clearly shows Conan Doyle didn't give it much weight as a forensic technique. There was indeed a fingerprint found at the crime scene, and to their credit, the Glasgow cops dusted Miss Gilchrist's flat for prints. They found a suspicious one, but again, because the science of fingerprinting was so new, there was no comprehensive database against which to compare the prints. Mm. So they came up empty. So again, that might have steered them away from Slater, but the science was was too much in embryo. Right, and uh, and their mindset wasn't about um, logic and reasoning. It was about a whole other thing. You describe it very well and call it a time of uh, the Victorian criminology. Uh, it, you, you quote the Queen from Alice in Wonderland. Say, the, I mean, a great definition of Victorian criminology. The racialization of crime is what the Queen in Alice in Wonderland says. Sentence first, verdict afterward. You, you have you point that out. That's right. What because the nascent forensic, more scientific approaches weren't developed enough to help Slater. What police and prosecutors fell back on was the old Victorian and pre-Victorian way of doing things, which was find a guy who looks different from you, whom you would be very happy to run out of town, stitch him up for a crime, no matter that he's innocent and everyone knows he's innocent, and run him out of town, maybe even run him into the grave. Conan Doyle spent the last 20 years of his life on this mm -hmm. case, and finally succeeds but how he gets back in or back in if, if that's the proper terminology is this is this great smuggling of a, of a note to talk about that right Conan Doyle has three major periods of involvement in 1912 when he writes his brilliant book and sadly it has no immediate effect again two years later when he presses for a judicial review of the case which as he says turns out to savor more of Russian than Scottish Europe jurisprudence, so that was no help to Slater either. Then things go quiet. One winter day in 1925, one of Slater's fellow convicts is paroled, a man named William Gordon. And as I say, Gordon would very likely have passed into history unnoticed except for the fact that he wore dentures. And underneath his dentures <laughs> that day rolled into a tiny pellet with a piece of glazed paper around it to keep out the moisture was an urgent note that Slater had slipped to him that said, go see Conan Doyle. And William Gordon did. Conan Doyle was moved to take up the case for the third time. For the third time. We're talking with Marguerite Fox about her terrific book, The True uh, Conan Doyle for the Defense, 
the uh, true story of a sensational British murder, a quest for justice, and the world's most famous detective writer. So he gets back in, and this time, eventually, a court of appeals does hear the case. That's right. interesting results from this court of appeal. And just the very fact that there is now a court of criminal appeal in Scotland, that was due partly to Conan Doyle's efforts on Slater's behalf. This is something mm -hmm. that we in our country take for granted. If you have a criminal conviction, your lawyer could appeal it. In Scotland, there was no such right until the late 1920s. They actually had to have a special hearing in Parliament to grandfather Slater's case in, to be retroactively reconsidered. And indeed, he was in 1927 acquitted on more or less a legal technicality based on very bad directions by the judge in the original trial, and he was let out of jail. But I, I, I focused on the fact that this court, reviewing everything, upholds the original conviction and upholds m more of the... The only reason they let him go was technical, as you pointed. Right. How, how, how is it possible for this court to uphold that conviction? Well, of course, I can't be in the heads of those justices right. in 1927, but I think part of it, uh, in my best guess, is they needed to save face for the system. They were presumably evaluating decisions by people who had been their colleagues, people whom presumably they knew. But they also had the fig leaf of saying the judge in the original trial in 1909 gave really terrible instructions to the jury, which he did. He literally mm. said uh, they brought in the fact that Slater was rumored to be a pimp. This was never proved, but that was the most damning thing you could say in this Edwardian climate about a man he was, who was clearly no gentleman. And so that was brought in. He was never charged with that. And to make matters worse, the judge in instructing the jury before deliberations began said, he has descended to the very depths of morality and is therefore not entitled to the same presumption of innocence mm. as an ordinary man. Can you imagine? Mm. And so it was on that point that 18 years later, the conviction was reversed. So he breaks rocks for 18 years but gets out, but he's, he's really of two minds about him. He's glad to be out and he's thankful to, to, to uh, Conan Doyle, but he hasn't been exonerated. He's, he, he, he's still being, you know, in public, he's still being at least thought of. Nobody is saying, no, he wasn't a pimp. No, he wasn't a bad guy. No, he wasn't all the things that we tried to show in, uh, in the trial to convict him. He really wanted to, to clear his name as well as to clear the crime. That's right. It was, Conan Doyle was a pragmatist. He was just grateful that they finally got the conviction reversed. But... In his way, uh, like Conan Doyle, Oscar Slater was also a Victorian man. He was a man of his times, and there was an intense concern in Victorian and post-Victorian life with reputation. And Slater felt his reputation had been sullied, and the decision only continued to sully it, even though it let him out of jail. And led to some bad blood between him and Conan Doyle when Doyle pragmatist said, okay, you know, you, you're, you're not going to get money from, the, from the, the state to pay you for your time, but at least pay, uh, and even if you do, at least pay off the people who've worked on this case and, you know, reimburse them, and he wouldn't do it. That's right. Slater eventually did get um, compensatory damages of 6,000 pounds from the Scottish government, mm. which in uh, 1928, when the award was made, was a lot of money. And here he was, this threadbare immigrant. He'd spent nearly two decades in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He was determined to hang on to the money. Conan Doyle, uh, who had spent his own money to get Slater exonerated right. and who had hired uh, various researchers, various other people, was absolutely determined, he'd hired lawyers, was absolutely determined that these people who had worked so hard on Slater's hat behalf be reimbursed. And, that uh, Slater 
didn't buy it. Slater didn't buy it, and it really is two men, both of whom were reared in poverty. One became eminent and wealthy, the other was not so lucky, and in the end, this case that started uh, partly as a result mm -hmm. of class tensions ended much the same way, and one of the most painful things I found in my research was a file in a Scottish archive labeled Conan Doyle v. Slater. Conan Doyle actually had to start to sue to try and get the money. They eventually settled. Well, I know you refrain from trying to solve the case of who really killed Ms. Gilchrist, but it seems like the maid knew a lot more than she said. It is very clear that Ms. Gilchrist's maid, who came back from buying the evening paper, an absence of 10 minutes to find her mistress brutally murdered, and saw a strange man, man she said was a stranger, leaving the flat and mm. going tearing down the stairs and out into the street. The maid on that night ran to another neighbor and said, my mistress has been murdered and I know the man who did it. She told the same thing to the police. That man, who was a relative of the old ladies, was a very highly placed member of Glasgow bourgeois society. Wow. So of course it was very quickly hushed up and the maid very quickly changed her story and said, I didn't recognize him. And she took that to her right. grave. We, we can't leave this without making the point that you make in the book about how, when you reflect on all of this, how this case so much mirrors our times, um, the racialization of crime. We have a president who rails about Mexicans coming across the border, raping and killing. We have Angela Merkel in, in Europe, uh, in Germany, having to walk back her open borders. We have serious questions about the um, viability of the EU, all about immigrants, all about the other, the mm -hmm. same. Yes, indeed. And I've wondered for the six years I've spent with this material, why isn't the Oscar Slater case better known? And my conjecture is that though there were many biographies of Conan Doyle after he died in 1930, these mid-20th century Sheree biographers were determined to um, construct this case as a dusty Edwardian relic. You know, we don't have the savageries and the bigotries that those people have. And so the Slater case kind of fell into a crevice in history. But when you examine it, it's about racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, the legislation of rules that will keep out immigrants, or at least keep the number of immigrants admitted down. And indeed, the binding up of crimes with the exotic other, the foreigner, the Jew, the immigrant. The, not Muslim, relevant, the Muslim. Not relevant to today. I'd say think again. I think it's very relevant to today, and I think you make a great case and a great book. Conan Doyle for the defense. It's delightful. You, this is a, not only a, I mean, summer, you could read this on the beach or you could study it in, your, you know, in a library. It's terrific. And thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for watching. We will see you next time.